Hi EXers, welcome to the EX Podcast, episode number 56. This is your host, Stefan Vincent. I'm here today with you because we need to shake things up in the world of HR, talent acquisition, and company culture in order to create positive employee experiences in our organizations. Your workplace doesn't have to be a dreadful place where employees feel disengaged. This podcast brings a different lens to the HR, employee engagement, and company culture conversation. We approach these topics from a brand and customer experience perspective rather than a traditional HR perspective. Our guests are thought leaders and disruptors in the EX space in their own way come to this show to share best practices on the key elements that foster employee engagement and strengthen company culture, and also to spark the conversation on how to create those positive employee experiences. Not every company can do what Airbnb or Google do around their employee experience. And this is what this show is all about, sharing stories of companies of all sizes not only to show that EX doesn't require a large budget or a large team, but also that there isn't one recipe. Each company can find its own way through the EX journey. Today's guest is Lina Stern, a thought leader in employee experience and organizational design in tech companies. Today with Lina, we talk about what is organizational design and how she uses it to challenge an organization's structure? Why the tech industry at large has a higher focus on the employee experience than other industries? What are the first elements that a CEO must consider when focusing on the employee experience? Who should own the employee experience? how to build a team and what skills sets are important in the EX space, how to leverage people data and behavioral sciences to drive human change, and finally, how the digital transformation is disrupting the way we work. This episode is brought to you by Fusion Alliance. Fusion Alliance delivers holistic solutions fusing together data, digital, and technology to redefine customer experiences and move your ideas to execution. That's why businesses across multiple industries have relied on Fusion's expertise and partnership for over 25 years. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Lena. And because it takes a good amount of time to produce this podcast, please make sure to review the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, or YouTube, as it would help promote the content. If you want me to speak at your next event, get some advice on your EX initiatives, or send me feedback, suggestions for future topics, or guests, you can reach me at svincent at exsummits.com or on Twitter at exsummits. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the EX Podcast. Today's guest is Lina Stern, calling from the Big Apple. And Lina is a thought leader in employee experience and organizational design in tech companies. Lina, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Nice to, nice to be here. Uh, to kick it off, uh, tell us a bit more about who you are and how you moved into the EX and organizational design space. That's a really good question. And, you know, I usually take a deep breath before I answer that at parties. <laughs> Uh, because it's hard to explain, but really throughout my entire career, I've been focusing on people-centric change. And I'm an organizational psychologist by trade, uh, and my expertise are really in learning, organizational design, coaching, and most recently, uh, employee experience and a lot of transformation work with different organizations. Um, in the past couple of years, I've really been leaning towards um, exploring the, the intersection between psychology and technology. And this is where employee experience becomes really fascinating. And um, having just led employee experience function for a fintech organization, um, it was really fascinating to do that from the ground up. 
Um, I've also led uh, global learning and OD teams, uh, built a lot of technology solutions, and really guided large organizations uh, throughout their cultural shifts, as many organizations are going through now. So how do you define organizational change or organizational design, and how do you use it to challenge an organization's uh, structure? It's a good question. So for me, organizational design has a lot of different meanings. And I think, um, you know, there's definitions out there and we all uh, in the practice tend to define it a little bit differently. It's kind of personal, but really the best way for me to describe it is really more of a wellness coach for organizations. So I I usually look at the pulse of the organization. I assess the health, the overall health of the organizations looking at different systems. I recommend how to bridge the gaps uh, for the organization to get healthy and also help them, you know, work at it uh, one employee at a time. So that's kind of the best allegory I can find around uh, organizational design and what that means for me. Uh, As far as the sort of the employee experience practice, um, it's really, you know, the way that I think about it is really personal to the organization. And it's a practice of designing experiences, events, products, focused on really high quality employee experience with strong organizational health, which is what we just talked about. And I really believe employees are sort of the first customers of any organization and we should be treating them as such. Uh, And they are the ones who are going to grow the business, help predict and influence the the culture and the products that the organizations will shape and put out. So it's really important to focus on them and how do they challenge uh, organizational structures that Uh, We're all very unique. Uh, We all come to work uh, with our whole selves, not just uh, as an employee. So um, I think it's really important to, uh, while creating personal journeys, uh, journeys, um, I think it's really important to to think um, of organizational design or employee experience as not necessarily a challenge, which definitely it presents many, uh, because it shifts the paradigm of how the organizations have been structured so far. But it's really about how we want to think about it for our employees and for ourselves as we go to work. Is is there a specific uh, element that triggers the decision for a CEO to focus on the employee experience and organizational design? Is it... Is it a different life stage um, in the company history? Is it a certain element from outside the organization that triggers that decision to focus on the EX? How does it work usually? Yeah, I, I think um, I don't think there's a usual answer to this question because each organization is so unique. I think I would say there's combination. Um, answers to that. So one is definitely the hype. Everyone else is doing it. We want to do it too. Uh, What is the competitive advantage of doing that? What will it bring to the organization from a strategic perspective? Um, How will we be able to become uh, more competitive with people who are currently in competition with us? And what would that mean for potentially getting in front of our future competitors? Um, So I think that there's a business element to that uh, foremost. And I think the second piece is um, they are looking at what hasn't been working in the organization. So, for example, people have not been engaged with us. We have high attrition uh, of really high talent. We can't attract the right people into our organization. So they're looking at the gaps uh, and they're saying, how can we fix that? And maybe some organizations are saying the current methods that we've been employing For example, just looking at engagement and measuring it after it happened might not be sufficient enough. And so they are looking, what are the new solutions? And employee experience tends to be right now sort of the hot topic of maybe this is one of the ways for us to think about it. You've been in in fintech for quite some time. And fintech, for those who are not familiar with the term, is a financial technology industry. And the tech industry at large has been... I would say probably more proactive than many other industries that embracing the concept of the employee experience. Is there a specific reason? I'm not sure if there's a specific reason. The way that I would think about it is it's very natural for fintech organizations or tech organizations because it's familiar to them. They already have the mindset geared towards experimentation. Mm -hmm. They have the need for speed. Uh, They have the people with similar expertise in-house who do similar work. For example, people who are responsible for roadmap creation in the product organization. They have uh, designers and uh, on user experience journeys. They have testers. They have people who are focusing on MVPs, uh, minimal viable products that they want to test in the market. 
and people who are very focused on uh, getting the right data and making the proper data-driven decisions. So it's almost a natural synergy. Uh, they have sort of the right mindset, the right I guess, tools and technology to have the right uh, data sets on their fingertips and also the right skill sets inside the organization. And I really like the analogy of EX being very much like software developments, where you have a huge emphasis and focus on the end user experience, as you mentioned. And then you're going to develop a minimal viable product. You're going to test it, get some feedback, iterate it, and change it again, uh, while some companies, even when they look at, oh, how can we better, how can we better engage our employees, they try to put in place a massive plan and take, they spend months and months and months to try to get it out uh, with usually not, um, not very success because they didn't actually approach it the right way, like you know, tech companies approach it uh, in an agile, agile way. Is it what you're seeing as well in um, other industries? Uh, I definitely see that as a pattern, but it's it's a part of our history, right? It's it's the way that we've been uh, learning to paint, if you will, mm -hmm. if you compare us to artists for a long time. And now uh, here comes Picasso, and he doesn't connect the two dots, right? So and and he's successful, and and how come? And so I think it's you know it's a part of our history of how we create big projects and big PMOs and organizations or change offices or whatnot, and we have this project and we have milestones and we have the roadmaps and the project managers tracking us through that. Um, and I think um, I think what really has changed for us in our lives overall is, is the exponential speed uh, and 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 the how how things have changed even between yesterday and today. And so we don't have the luxury of larger projects while we have the skill sets to deliver that maybe. Um, and also not only things are changing so much, people don't have the aptitude to wait, right? For example, I'm sure you've heard, yes. you know, who wants to read this anymore? People just want to watch it, right? And mm -hmm. uh, even what they watch becomes so short, right? So we went, uh, we had episodes uh, on Netflix for, for um, 30 minutes or 33 minutes. Now they have 15 minutes, you know, uh, episodes in terms of the shows that you like to watch, for example. So everything is, is not only growing, but it's growing exponentially fast. There's no time. And then the tolerance for how the information is, Uh, channeled and received um, is is uh, has really changed. So I think that's sort of the the lot of the whys behind things that why the uh, things are changing in that direction. And not to say that uh, sort of the foundations of project management or having large projects is not a good idea. I think it is. It's, it should still be exercised in parallel. Uh, but uh, a lot of organizations are working in more agile ways, which, frankly, that word is a little bit overused. Um, it is. <laughs> yes, and, and we, we all define it differently, right? We right. have the scrum mastership and all that great stuff. But um, I think sort of the bottom line is we're all moving faster. The way that we, we consume information is completely different. Uh, we need to move and change with that as well. And the way that we deliver projects um, also needs to do that. And I think the other element here, which hopefully we will talk about, is sort of the human element of how we interact with each other, how our brains work. Um, and with that, we also need to apply that to our work life, because I think in the past we, we may be overlooking that a little bit. And I think a, a key difference as well is the the recognition of the fact that we don't have to, we don't need to have a, a very polished finite product or initiative before we launch it. It's more about you no, know, as as you said earlier, it's a minimum viable product. It's something that is going to to meet some basic expectations, some basic needs. We're going to launch it. We're going to get some feedback. We're going to make some enhancements as we test it um, on, on the ground. Uh, and then just people will react to it. And I think it's the recognition of this that we don't have to wait for that very polished plan in order to test it. Exactly. And I, I think that now people have that expectation. You have the concept of early adopters, people who want to test it, you know, the ones who stand in line waiting for their new iWatch. Uh, they want to play it with it. They want to work out all the kinks, uh, and they will and tell you uh, what is working for them, what is not working for them, and then you can actually adjust it. And I think that that creates not only the kind of the speed and agility um, and better product over time, but I think what it creates is 
an opportunity for the consumer to participate with the builder. And that's in such a unique way that our economy is shaping right now. It's fascinating. When a CEO is looking at what his company's employee experience should be like, what are the first elements to consider? I think the first I would ask the question is, why is he looking? Mm -hmm. What is his motivation? How does it tie to his or her business strategy? Uh, and then I would first look at what data or information he or, he or she already has uh, and what does he need together to decide what is going to be the vision and guiding principles for his uh, EX design process. So I think, you know, spending a lot of time on the why, spending a lot of time on planning and thinking, which we don't usually do. Uh, we're like, okay, here's here's where we need to go. Here's the gaps and we're going to go execute and deliver on that. And then uh, we, we don't we don't give ourselves enough time to think. And I have I call that concept personally rollerblades on ice. And I feel that a lot <laughs> when I'm at work is I'm just going and I'm on rollerblades when I always have the right tools and I'm on ice. So I'm sort of kind of shaking. I'm just I just can't stop. Right. So um, it's really important to be able to do that. And then once you have that you can consider sort of the key personas you will focus on, what are going to be the key journeys you want to map out. And then, of course, it becomes a matter of tactical delivery and testing and iteration around that. And I think it's, it's a, one of, probably one of the biggest challenges, if not the biggest challenge for uh, CEOs when they look at implementing uh, any EX uh, strategy is How do you define success and how do you measure the success and the impact on the business? Because EX has to have a specific meaning and an impact on the business. Otherwise, it, it's, it, it, doesn't have, uh, it doesn't have a reason to exist, really. Right? Because the overall goal is really to be able to make an impact or different types of impact on the business. That's right. I definitely agree with that. And I think it's it's something that's really hard to put together and it's very personal to the organization you're working for, right? So as, as we use the same wellness analogy, you know, me losing five pounds is very different from somebody who wants to lose 40 pounds. Mm -hmm. uh, and those measures will be very different um, and who we are as people. So, um, but I would probably think about, you know, in the general ways, how do we measure the customer experience for that organization product or business line? Right. And then I would probably align it directly into the employee experience, starting with, with the NPS course. And there seems to be a confusion between employee engagement and employee experience. A lot of people just use one, one word or the other um, without any specific distinction. What difference do you make between the two? I think one lives inside the other. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not necessarily that they are different from each other. They are interconnected. Uh, so employee engagement is a piece of employee experience. It doesn't, uh, one doesn't sort of define the other. Uh, so I, that's sort of the way that I'm thinking in that. And employee engagement is, I'm really engaged with you. So think of, you know, your significant other or somebody that you are in love with. You know, how do you engage with them, right? You are engaged to them or you're about to get married to them or you're in a relationship with them. Uh, now you can still go through fights. You can still, you know, go through your uh, financial book and be very analytical about it. You can still plan a vacation together. So um, employee experience is the, is the all-encompassing and, frankly, is an human experience, all-encompassing into who you are, the moments in your life, how, the, how you interact with each other. And, and then the employee engagement is the relationship or the degree of the relationship you currently have with this particular organization or that team or that business. So that's the way that I'm looking at it. And um, yeah, they're certainly different in terms of how people define it. And I know for the past you know, decades, we have been looking at employee engagement, the scores, the surveys. Um, and I think it's a very key element in one of the data sets, but it again, lives inside the employee experience who also lives within, within the human experience. There's a debate and there are many talks about who should own the employee experience. And obviously it varies from one organization to another. But ideally, in your mind, who should own the employee experience? And the related question to it is, how do you assemble a team and what skills or experience are important for that team to have? Wow, it's a, 
it's a sensitive question uh, because I think right now as the field of employee ex- experience is coming to life and uh, gaining ground, um, it sometimes lives with and sometimes in opposition to current structures. So uh, from my perspective, um, there's really a couple of places it could live. If nobody really owns employee experience, in my opinion, because the same way nobody owns culture, nobody owns innovation, but it's really the CEO or the office of the CEO, uh, the people uh, who lead the company or the shareholders who, who own the employee experience. Um, and uh, I know a lot of the times it lives within the HR organization, I um, don't really believe it needs to live in one place because a lot of it is marketing, products, some of it is HR, mm-hmm. uh, or the, the way we have been defining HR, and a lot of it is, is within our leadership teams and then across the organization. So um, it's hard to say some, you know, I know that, um, you know, we have established it uh, in within the HR organization, but also living with, across digital product and technology organizations. Some companies have their own separate sort of office that, uh, is correlated to HR, but then is not directly reporting into the HR organization. So I think right now it's sort of this flux of what works for each company. Um, I'm sort of a huge advocate for exploring what works for you and having it live as a, almost a separate function that has um, you know, interdependencies as well as connections to other functions within the organization. And I agree that it's 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 very difficult to have one team that is specifically affect, uh, affected to the employee experience. And I usually preach the idea of employee experience governance, where you actually form a committee of people from different groups within the organization that have the right mindset and the right expertise to work on specific elements of the entire employee experience, but they don't master everything. So we were talking about marketing and HR. Obviously, marketing professionals have an idea of how to conduct market research, how to do segmentation within their customer their customer base. And they can apply to the employee side as well. You know how to drive uh, or to design journey mapping, and uh, how to develop the right message and to deliver to the right audience. All these type of things, but they don't understand necessarily the the legality and the compliance aspect of HR, which typically a uh, sorry uh, of employee experience, which typically HR people have. So, if you were to if you were to create the ideal team to either oversee or manage the employee experience, what would be the different areas or different teams of a company or different departments of the company that would pull those people from? And what type of skills or expertise would you be looking for? Um, that's a good question. So uh, first, a shout out to my former team, who I believe was a perfect EX team. Uh, you guys know who you are. Uh, but the way that I would think about building an EX organization is um, sort of through the lens of what kind of competencies do those people have and backgrounds versus where they sit. So I think the kind of the first uh, person that I would hire is the person maybe who has um, very solid human background, so having um, either maybe lived in a production or theater world, somebody who has had experience uh, maybe in advisory and consulting, um, somebody who has had a lot of facilitation, learning, um, communications background, so kind of more of a kind of a chameleon of sorts, if you will, um, who can go across uh, different disciplines uh, and pull from, but not necessarily be an expert in one. But most important piece is how they relate to people, uh, how they interview them, how they connect to them, how they can interpret data and how they can put all of it together. So that would be sort of one kind of person. And I know they it's hard to find them, but they do exist. Another one I would probably think about is a learning technologist and or a technologist who can focus on uh, design. And I mean um, design of learning, design of experiences, Um, somebody maybe who had uh, some background in front-end development, has some background in instructional design, more of a technologist at heart, but really focused on how do you build exciting programs or experiences for people. And that could be mobile, that could be virtual reality, that could be 
um, how do you engage through an event, uh, so maybe some event management there as well, but from a creative perspective. So uh, somebody, again, with a tech and or agency background. Um, and I would probably think about another uh, type of person who um, would really create the white glove experience across the organization. When we say white glove, we usually think of CEOs, right? Uh, but I want to think about anyone who's an intern even coming into the organization and having this really a person to talk to, right? And even our call centers now say, you know, you're talking to Bob in, in Arizona and, you know, I live here with my wife, right? So it's that it's that human experience, somebody that you can connect to, the face that you know, even in larger organizations, having sort of a in-play experience, um, I wouldn't call that person a coordinator, but like a um, uh, an, an, an architect, if you will, uh, of that experience, somebody that, that you can talk to, um, that you recognize. I think it's really important as you build really personalized experiences. It's easier to do in smaller organizations, much harder to do in larger organizations, uh, but can be segmented um, into a variety of different roles. And then, of course, um, I would partner a lot um, with different types of uh, individuals, whether it's across the organization or from a vendor perspective, to come in and out and provide sort of touch services, for example, on, on, for onboarding, for leadership development, mm -hmm. for any online um, or platform experiences. So I would think about sort of partnerships and then really core team of people um, around the employee experience space who have sort of the skill sets I described. I'm a huge advocate of applying journey mapping that we discussed a little bit uh, earlier to the employee side, the same way companies with a strong customer experience focus do uh, for their customer journey maps. Um, so when, when you look at journey mapping, what are some of the critical steps to consider? I think first you probably want to go back to the why and why you're doing that and a data collection piece. And then you would look at your population and you do the segmentation analysis. Um, you agree uh, on on the personas you want to focus on in terms of who are going to be a super personas, uh, which ones are going to be critical. And based on that, uh, you then uh, reach out and uh, based on data, decide what journeys you're going to map. Is it going to be... Um, an onboarding journey is it going to be an alumni journey? Uh, is it going to is a journey going to segment us into um, how the customer reacts to a particular product? It would depend on the strategy of the organization, uh, all the data sets that you've collected, and the segmentation analysis you've done, and of course all the feedback from the empathy interviews and the like. Um, and then from there, I think what's really critical is when when you visualize all the journeys and you map them out, you don't just focus on the moments that matter. You focus on the moments that matter that tie to your business. Mm -hmm. um, you focus on the moments that matter that where the data told you that, uh, that you know, it hasn't been positive, right? Uh, when I walk through the door and nobody greets me and I have to go through an iPad, I like it or I don't like it, right? So if that's a negative experience for me and that's the data set that we've been receiving consistently, we might want to change that as opposed to just, you know, how we dress or what we eat, right? So I think that's going to be very critical. And then um, how we resolve for that um, also becomes um, quite interesting because this is where project management comes in, right? We always talk about, oh, you know, agile development and MVPs, and that's good. But if you don't deliver really, really well and you don't have some project management expertise and program building expertise here at that juncture, that's actually where things don't go well. So you got all this data, you mapped it all out, You've sort of agreed to how it matches to your future strategy, but now you have to fill the gaps. And that's, I think, also another key skill set that's going to be really important that we tend to overlook because we're looking at all the cool new stuff. Um, mm. and, we, and we do need to sort of pause and say, just because it's something we've been doing, you know, from before or it's not as it's not considered as cool, if you will, uh, it doesn't mean that it's outdated or it doesn't have its value. Uh, talking about data, specifically, companies sit on a ton of employee data, but many of them have no clue how to, uh, what to do with this. How do you leverage people data and behavioral sciences to drive human change? 
that's a big question. Uh, I think a lot of organizations are trying to work this out right now. I think first you need to understand what you do have in-house and how clean it is, quote unquote, right? Mm -hmm. You might have a lot of data, but it might not be relevant. It might not be the right data. It might not be accurate. I know we, everyone's going through sort of system reengineering work and uh, legacy system conversions. Yes. And so we tend to have a lot of data, but is it the right data and is it the clean data first, right? I would also urge you to apply research methods um, the way we see we do in psychology and data science to build the data collection methodology and output. Um, and I think it's really, really important to say, how do we zero in on data? We can go macro or micro um, and how we collect it, how we scrub it and how we present it. We'd, I would you know, think very strongly about having people with um, specific degrees on that, uh, focusing on, on how to do that. And I have worked in organizations um, where we've had a data science team and, and my team specifically uh, focused on research methods and how do you get the data, make sure that it's unbiased, make sure that all the experimentation is done in a proper lab environment and um, how do we, whatever that, whatever that output is, is a clean output. So let's talk about a bit more about a sentiment analysis. Uh, obviously, there's a ton of data from um, the data in the uh, in the HR management system, uh, but also companies spend now more and more time doing surveys uh, with different types of results. Obviously, depending on how well it's designed and how often they conduct surveys. But when 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 companies are looking at designing a survey. Um, how should they approach the design of the survey and how often should they survey their employees? I think I would first ask, why do we just focus on a survey? Uh, I can answer those questions first if you'd like, but I would, probably, yes. I would probably think about it more globally and say, what other data currently exists? For example, do we have any way that we can look at natural language processing, text analysis, G, you know, Gmail or, you know, um, Outlook analysis in terms of the language that's used in our emails and communications, the number of hours we spend in meetings. So I would probably think about what else is out, out there besides serving, because we have been, you know, out, out served it and surveyed fatigued for yes. many, many years. Uh, a lot of organizations now do EMPS scores, which is the employee scores on kind of the pulse surveys. Uh, some organizations tend to do that month, uh, once a quarter, um, they want to do, uh, have short bursts and then collect the data across and they use less than five questions. So, um, I think again, it depends on what you're trying to collect. I again would urge to say that while surveying is great and is one of the really important, uh, data collection method, it's not always the best. Uh, and there are other, uh, data methodologies you can employ, um, that already are there that you don't need to ask your employees for. Um, that you can use as a part of your analysis. You can also correlate data to see if there's a you know upswing um, uh, around something that you want, for example, or a downswing by comparing two numbers. So, for example, uh, very very simply put, if you compare your attrition number, your voluntary attrition number, to the to the number of um, learnings, whatever they mean, online, in person, um, through a platform that these employees did and didn't do, you can say, okay, people who are potentially um, are participating in more learning in our organization tend to be more engaged and they tend to leave less often, right? So as an example, there's a lot you can do with correlation analysis as well. Now, there's always a concern around uh, privacy when it comes to the data conversation. And obviously the data usually is used in an aggregated way, so we don't actually put a specific identity on a specific set of data that's going to be Jane Doe's data specifically. It's more about a type of demographic, a type of um, employee or department or whatever it might be. Um, so that helps, uh, that should help alleviate a little bit the, the idea of you know, being concerned about private data privacy. But at the same time, we, we never talk about employee experience for the entire organization being the same, right? Employee experience has to be catered to different employee segments. So how do you find the right balance between making sure that we have data privacy, 
but we also to use the data to somehow personalize the experience to different employee types. Wow, that's a that's a question that people can write a case study on. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if anyone can really uh, answer that. I don't know if anyone has truly resolved it uh, with proper outcomes just yet. Uh, I think everyone's testing it. I think that data privacy, we, we should treat it, of course, with high regard, um, and we should comply with whatever standards our organization sets for us. And usually within FinTech or tech uh, or in financial services specifically, that's highly regulated. So, you know, staying with that is really important. And I think um, another really big element from a um, kind of ethics perspective is, you know, we as employees don't really own our own data just yet, which is very interesting conversation maybe for another time. But I'm fascinated with the fact that we own, uh, somewhat own our data and give it away, right? Yes. With Facebook and Instagram uh, as consumers, but we don't really own our data as employees at all. In fact, we sign that data away uh, all the time. And that's that's a whole ethical, interesting, what is it going to look like in the future conversation? It is. Um, which I'm sure it's, it's, it's not for right now, but I, I would say that um, obviously compliance is important and needs to be there and because compliance is really about ethics and protection. But it's also um, about drawing the line and each organization has its own line, right? And I don't mean the line of you know, regulatory compliance things, but I mean the line of privacy that goes beyond that. So once we have met those you know, minimal requirements, um, do we do our or do our employees want to tell us things? And a lot of the times they do because it's about their feedback on on the on the product of the experience. So that should be probably pretty open and with a choice, right? Um, other things such as um, you know I just went through you know a learning experience for example, and you know I didn't do so well. Uh, because I took a, you know, a test at the end. I mean, that's obviously significantly more private. So I think it's how do you define that criteria each for organization? Where do you want to draw the line? And I would invite a lot of um, companies to think about um, actually defining that outside of compliance because it doesn't exist. Having their employees uh, think about that together with them and putting forward their own points of view and proposals. Uh, because again, we live in a generation where we give away our data. We're comfortable with that. Um, and uh, some people want to do it and some people don't want to do it. So do we personalize that? Do we draw the line at, you know, assessment? What do we do? And I think it's it's a larger question. I don't have an answer, but I um, I think uh, it's important to, to explore it. it. It is a tough question, definitely. Digital technology has drastically transformed the way we work and the way we live and the way we communicate and the way we learn as well. So maybe let's, tie, let's take the next six, ten minutes to discuss um, some related questions to digital transformation. Sure. So first of all, how is the digital transformation disrupting the way we work? Well, first, let's define digital transformation. <laughs> Well, I think <laughs> let's do it because I think, uh, as you've seen for the past at least eight years, um, in, in in banking specifically, but you know across all industries, uh, organizations have been trying to define it, lead it, say they've done it successfully. Um, I would love to be able to be a part of a of a conversation where uh, there are leaders in digital uh, transformation who are telling me that they have been 100% successful um, because I would love to see that, right? And I think everyone is sort of trying and getting it right in some ways and struggling in other ways. But I think first defining it, so I'm not sure exactly, you know, how we want to discuss that, but it's disrupting it in a way that we're thinking something new is coming, we can't really define it, but we got to get on board because if we don't, we're not going to be successful. We won't survive. So that's kind of this whole fear element um, behind let's change, right? Do we want change? Everyone raises their hand. Are you ready to change? No one's in a room, right? So, so that's sort of another piece. And it's really fundamentally changing our society as we know it. Um, and I... I really believe we we live in a digital world now, more or less. We're going to, we're going more towards being almost inside of it completely, and I think it's disrupting us from from the way that we interact with our organizations, from the way we interact with each other, the way that our children interact with with their schools and with each other. 
I think it's just fundamentally changing everything. But in business, um, it's the it's the fear, it's the race to the finish line or to or or the fight for survival. It's the new hype of we're all going to do that so we can be successful. It's failing at it, I would say, many, many times. It's sometimes getting it right in pockets. Um, and I think it's, you know, our children are going to look back at us, the next generation, and say, well, <laughs> what are you guys talking about? We're already digital. We, we, what do you mean, digital transformation? You're talking about that. We're living it. Right. And so when I look at my children, and that's the exactly the experience. I remember my, my son was, when he was five years old, he's 10 now, he would, you know, come to a restaurant and like try to move the table with his hands and say, mommy, the table's not responding to me. I'm like, it's not interactive, <laughs> sweetheart. It's just a table. So for them, you know, it's a digital world. For us, it's, we're transforming something. Yeah, that, that's really, it. it's a great way to, to put it. So with the, the advance of digital technology without necessarily using the word transformation, Customers are more than ever before in the driver's seat. You know, they choose when, how, why they want to interact with a brand. And it's no longer the other way around where the brand dictated what the experience should be to their customers. And we, because we all consumers, customers, and employees for many of us, and we don't actually make that clear distinction between the customer versus the employee experience. We just expect some sort of experience wherever we are. So do you see that employees now are more in the driver's seat as well as they are as customers, where they're challenging, they're challenging organizations to really think forward in terms of creating specific experiences for them? Yes, absolutely. And it's the crowdsourcing mentality. Uh, we've been living and now sort of living in for a while. If you think about simply FMLA leave in New York State, which is where I come from, uh, they recently just extended it, right, allowing uh, more benefits for uh, working parents. And that came from organizations like Netflix who have, had, for example, expanded their uh, FMLA leave to six months and other organizations specifically in technology are following suit. And so this crowdsourcing like expectation of, the employees or the people are telling us this is what they need to be successful. We want to retain this really good talent in order for us to do that. This is the benefits we need to offer, the new benefits. And the other companies are catching on and it's creating this kind of movement, right, towards something we all deserve or need. So absolutely, um, there are a lot more power behind the consumer and a lot more power behind the employee in numbers over time. Now, if we think about an individual person living in a large organization or a division living in a, as, as, a, as a part of global institution, yeah, I think that takes a lot more time. And sometimes it feels like you're on this gigantic, uh, gigantic ship and you're trying to cor change the course of the direction of that ship. And it takes some time for that ship to turn around. So you, you, you're not on, on the motorboat, right, to do that, or you're not in a really fast you know, jet ski to do that. So I think it's slower uh, depending where you sit, but it's definitely there and more, po more power to us all. And technology allows learning on demand. We talked a little bit about it, where we don't have to sit in classrooms for four hours or plus anymore. What are you seeing in terms of relying more and more on technology to um, onboard new employees, to teach and educate employees as they go through their uh, through their career how do you see the place of technology into the uh, employee experience as a whole and trying to um, move people to some of the aspirations uh, that they have in terms of career move and uh, learning new skills and new things it's 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 an integral part of employee experience, uh, personal experience. You know, we all live on our phones, right? Uh, we, we we live in different channels. Uh, we live across different platforms. So the same way we live, we should be working, right? So you're on Slack, you know, talking to your friends, doing some you know emojis and uh, gifs or gifs, whatever, which whatever way you pronounce it. 
Um, you are on email sometimes, and most of the time you're not, right? You are on Google Chat and or uh, Instagram if you want to kind of share some of your personal journeys. You're on whatever platform your organization uses outside of uh, Slack and Gmail and 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 chat options. So I think that. Um, you know, we, we live in the same way that we should be working and vice versa uh, and kind of those lines are blurring. So, yes, it's a huge part of our lives and therefore it's a huge part of our work and should be. And I think new technologies is, a, is really cool to really play and experiment because you have this really captive audience at work uh, of groups of people who are similar and sometimes very different. And you can experiment on how people react to things, um, whether they are, you know, mobile technologies, you know, virtual reality technologies, augmented uh, reality technologies, and or just the technology of being able to order your lunch, you know, without leaving a meeting. So, yes, absolutely interconnected. As an example, we, we recently rolled out a, a platform called Degreed for our learning. It's, uh, it's an amazing platform. So it's an anti-LMS um, and uh, what it does is allows our employees to really connect uh, to each other, um, connect to their own learning, move really fast, and integrate their personal learning as well as their professional learning. So let's say I'm a big fan of blockchain and I've been liking your post on blockchain on LinkedIn. I've been reading some articles on um, on it and I've been doing some TED Talk uh, views on, on blockchain, but I also have been tapping into my internal resourcing within my organization on it and sort of combines it all and becomes really social, personalized journey and can live as a as sort of a front end or a um, the user experience platform for whatever back end you have internally to the organization, which we love. So I'll promote that a little bit. And um, I'm a big fan of the company and the product itself. So that's kind of one way that we have thought about how do we integrate new interesting technologies uh, into what we already have without having to break or or change too much, uh, but introducing what employees really want, which is an interactive way to manage their learning across their life. And we we talk a lot about automation and AI and AI and how it's going to disrupt not only the way we work, but even the type of work that humans do versus what machines could do in the next few years. How do you see organizations looking at how work would uh, would be or would would look like in the next, let's say, five or ten years? Do you see drastic changes where we're going to have we're going to rely more on robots and machines to do some of the work, uh, and then maybe some of the some of the skills would just shift to. Um, different areas what what are you seeing there i i definitely see a, a huge uh, change in in that space and uh it's actually quite troublesome if you think about um all the upskilling and reskilling that needs to happen in our world and then how fast it's happening and how things are becoming obsolete uh that's sort of the one scary perspective but like the, the more realistic one is you know, you talk about machine learning, but now, for now, it's been pretty basic, right? So yes. you still need a human to look at exceptions or to make really complex decisions. So I think it's going to take some time to get to the point where, you know, humans are no longer needed, maybe in certain positions for sure. But again, that reskilling and upskilling needs to happen. Um, you know, when I was little, I remember writing an essay uh, about what the future of school is going to look like. And I remember being in third grade and I wrote this essay and I really imagined that one day there will be a robot in front of the room and, you know, imagine the guy, you know, all in metal, you know, going, boop, pa, pa, you know, if, to us. And, you know, now that I am, you know, living it to a degree, um, it's fascinating, but it's never how I truly imagined it to be. So I don't think, I think, ro you know, robotics, I think AI, I think machine learning um, or artificial intelligence of any kind um is going to enhance our lives. I think we have to be careful about how we do that. But I, I, I don't necessarily believe that it's going to be immediate and everyone's going to lose their jobs and we're all going to be, you know, fighting with the machines. I think they're going to enhance our lives, especially, um, you know, anything to do with medicine. It's amazing, you know, advances in that area. Anything to do with, like, uh, manual labor. So I think there's two questions. One is it's going to affect us 
and it's going to be a little bit slower than everyone thinks and less scary. And the other piece is the scary part is how do we change who we are and our skill sets now so that we are relevant for the future? And that's a big question that we all should be thinking about. Yes, and I mean, technology has already has always been there. You know, it obviously technology today is different from what technology was in in the fifth in the nineteen fifties, for instance. But when we went from you know, farm work to tractors doing most of the work that humans used to do, and when we look at uh, car manufacturing, for instance, where we had a lot of people working in plants, and now pretty much everything is automated. It didn't. It didn't cut jobs or destruct jobs. It's just that people moved on to different different jobs, and that's really where I think that technology would push us in the next few years. It's that many many things that, especially in, I mean, you've been in fintech for quite some time already, so you've seen this, uh, you know, fintech disrupting the traditional banking system or you know home loaning system. Right, so I think that people would just adapt, and they will they will learn new skills. They would just move to different different uh, types of uh, different types of positions. I think in different types of work. Yes, uh, I do. I you know I, I do also think that there is an element of um, well, what you were describing around industrial revolution and the like is the speed of that was much slower, right? So people had the yes, time to sort of re- reprogram, if you will. I think our speed now is significantly different, which makes it probably a little bit more challenging. And then the second piece is that whatever the new jobs are being created, right? You know, we went from, you know, having, you know, a hammer in our hand to, to, to now having some sort of a, a tool doing it for us. Now it's more the new jobs that are being created are going to bots, right? So we don't need somebody to go and do business analysis, you know, by looking at the market and comparing one to one, we have an algorithm to do that. Mm-hmm. Now, but that person no longer has a job and has to completely reskill. So I think those two elements are quite real. And I mean, there's a lot of literature out there and, and, and opinions of how we can manage that. But I think it's a personal journey of like, who do you want to be? How do you want to change for the future? What do you see for yourself? And can you do it fast enough? All right, we're getting close to the end of our yes. conversation today. So let me ask you some fun questions before we conclude for for the day. Um, if you were to invite a historical figure or someone famous to dinner, who would you choose and why? So I just came back from a really fun trip in Italy. So I would invite Cosmo de, de Medici, uh, who was a patriarch of a great dynasty in Italy in the time of Renaissance. And he was one of the great you know, business and art influencers of the time. And uh, he built uh, lots of amazing art and have uh, captured a lot of amazing art, big sponsor of that. So I would would love to have dinner with him, A, because it would be in Italy, (laughs) and B, because I would love to learn uh, um, more about sort of how he built an empire, both a business and an art empire, and sort of kept it in the family. So that would be really fascinating. Interesting. Uh, What was your dream job as a kid? Oh my goodness, I don't think I had any. I was thinking about that and I didn't think I wanted to work at all. Uh, I, th- I thought I just wanted to play the whole time. I think by the time I, I became a teenager, that became a little bit more. I think then I started to think I wanted to be a lawyer and pursued that for a while, but that died a dream. Um, I, you know, I, I think most recently um, I was thinking about what if, wouldn't it be awesome to be a psychologist on staff working with engineers to build uh, the emotional intelligence of, you know, of AI. Oh. That's more of a that's more of a current dream. Oh, very interesting. Very very interesting. Uh, if you were to pick three survival items on a de- to go on a deserted island, which ones would you pick? Matches that are waterproof, water or access to water or ability to get water of some kind, and then a spear gun with a beacon so I can go hunt for fish and if somebody comes around I can shoot it up in the air and, you know, get noticed. All right. Well, you talked about Italy. Um, do you have any other favorite vacation spot beyond Italy? 
Yes, uh, definitely Iceland. I feel like it's sort of virgin earth uh, before we ruined it. Uh, and then Sedona, Arizona, which is an amazing place to be, uh, has all the vortexes uh, of, of our planet uh, around it, and it's, it's, it's mesmerizing. I love Sedona as well. I can relate to that beautiful place. Um, what is your personal motto? Uh, it is always personal, then it's business. Uh, which kind of speaks to, you know, people are people first. Uh, you treat them as people and then you treat them as the CEO or as the, or as the intern or as the person with X amount of capability. So uh, you, you look at the whole first, uh, person first. What is the way for our listeners to follow you on social media? That's a good question. Um, probably on LinkedIn. Um, that would be the best way. Uh, Lena Stern is a very easy name. Uh, feel free to do that. I do a lot of blogs uh, through LinkedIn, and I'm um, happy to connect and chat. All right, and we'll share this on the podcast notes as well. Any last word of advice or wisdom? Have fun. Always have fun in what you do. The minute it becomes not as fun, think about it. Is this a challenge? Is this just an, an extra five reps I have to do with my exercise bell? Or is it truly not something I really want to do? So just have fun with whatever you do. That's a good way to end the conversation today. I did have fun talking with you, Lena. Thank you so much. Thank you. Me too. Thanks for tuning in to the EX Podcast. If you want to learn more, visit our website at expodcast.com. If you want to find out more about our next conferences, go to exsummit.com. Finally, you can also find my manifesto on business to employee or B2E branding at b2ebranding.co. See you next week.